So then on Scandalous, one of my favorite songs is Leave That Curl Alone, which yeah. keeps, Leave, keeps leave the, My Curl uh, Alone. The comedy going. But because uh, <laughs> I liked it back in the day, looking like full force and, and talking yeah. about um, hair being longer than the girls and stuff. Yeah. But why was your hair and hair so important to you at that point in your life? Soren, I know you from, you know, you from back, back out the ways, but that's a straight motherfucking Cali thing. Like back then we had the big perms with the rollers, with the curls. We had the finger waves. We had, that's just like some, from California so all the way up to the Bay, all the way down to, to, to Dago. Like we just, that was like our fly shit. When you say fly, like our hair, like iced tea, like when he said on oh, my hair, my shoulders that lay like, that was just some West Coast. That's what we did, bro. We did the curl. We did the press. We did the, like, I had all that shit, man. That was just kind of like our shit, you know? Yeah. That was always uh, very strange and foreign to me. I saw it in the <laughs> but I, never... I know, because like when I went to the East Coast to promote some of my records, I had motherfuckers looking at me. Even girls were like, oh, what are you doing with that long hair? <laughs> it's like... I thought I was the shit. I came off here swinging, you know, I'm doing my shit, and they look at me like, ugh. Did your af activator swing? <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> activator swinging, grease stain and shit. Yeah. Well, yeah. I really, on Scandalous, really uh, enjoyed the beginning of the album because of the way the intro, the leave my curl alone, and then with the uh, punk shit, the thing that always impressed me or surprised me was how you had talked about getting hit and taking one to the eye and yeah. kind of turning the table like you weren't always super tough guy. So yeah. from the writer perspective and you as a person, why was that something that you wanted to like show a different side of not being the winner all the time? Well, actually, so and that shit was kind of like, a, a, not kind of, it was a real story. Like I went into a spot to where I was messing with some dude that always wanted to hit me up for some mixtapes and shit and I kind of was in the, you know, Cali, like I said, it's like neighborhood shit. It's just a whole culture of it. And now everybody just, they're making this shit kind of like commercial, but it was really spots that you weren't supposed to be in when you doing your shit. So one morning I got up super early, like, okay, let me beat these dudes to the punch. I'm gonna go over here and drop this tape off to this other dude. And um, I, when I went to go drop the tape off, it was about seven or eight motherfuckers in there that I was like, oh, shit, like, they up. Like, to me, like, in my mind, like, what the fuck you doing up this early? It was like 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to slide in and slide out. But they was probably on they, they probably stayed up all night. So when I went to the spot to drop this tape off, they caught me in there. And that's all that shit I was talking about on there really happened. Like, motherfuckers, I got into a whole situation. But yeah. thank God it worked itself out the way it was supposed to because I'm still here. And, you know, but... It was some real shit. Yeah, thankfully. Yeah. Yep. And, and also on that, that's one of my favorite songs on the album, too, because of the story, but also the scratching, the Scooby-Doo. Yeah. The changes, just so much about it. Um, yeah. So, obviously, you produced a lot yourself, too. So, as a producer, when you have, like, a beat change and you have these, like, stories going on, what do you think that adds looking at things on a production standpoint, what does that add to the song? To me, it's like, uh, like I just reverted back to my music stuff that I was being taught, like I said, in the middle school, junior high era by my um, music instructor and shit, like B sections, turn around. It's a science to the music, you know what I mean? It's not just like put the mic on and just start rapping and shit. It's like, you ask person about a 16 bar or a, a hook that's four bars or eight bars, like it's really math to this shit. And it's really like a science. And to me, sometimes it get lost when people just want to say words and shout out some shit or do the same old shit. So to me, like when we had these B sections or these changes or these turnarounds, to me, it just kind of like gave it that, um, that just the the difference it broke up the monotony of the music just one beat just playing all along like when you hear uh dance band like music or something and then it broke down boom dun, dun, psh, boom boom dun, like motherfuckers start doing they the hardest dancing when that part of the song come on like i know you probably seen it like they'll wait for that break in the song for that shit to come on so they can just start doing their hardest dance you know what i mean so 
I just wanted to break it up and give it a different feel just to make it like, to me, music is a feel. When you put on the beat and you get that first feel of that shit, like once I jump, it's like, uh, like how the girls used to do the double dutch with the ropes. Once I get in, it's kind of like I, where I'm going to get in at. Once I get in, I'm going. Like I, I ain't going to stop until my feet get tangled up. Yeah. So, so also with, with that being said, being that you were rolling with childhood friends, kind of grew up with quick, how, how and why did you and Tony A kind of go off and, and do scanless as opposed to stay and just do stuff with quick? Well, that happened because I was, mind you, Quick was signed into Profile Records. Um, AMG, I think he did Select, if I'm not mistaken, Select. And I was on the way of getting my own deal with Disney. So we all had, tight as we were, we all had different second and I was with Profile too. We all had our record deal. Like, we was like the talk of the town, the hot shit. So, you know, it's like sign these, like all the record companies wanted to sign us, but it was different companies that wanted our stuff. I ended up going with Disney. They had a lot of money. Uh, Quick was working on this profile deal. Second and none had the profile. AMG had to select. So that's pretty much what took me to like working with Tony A. Steve Yano was my manager at the time. So he just went from being like the dude that knew about music to actually managing me. And Steve, I mean, uh, Tony being a producer, I produced some of the stuff and we just got together, man, and just got our own deal. Like, <laughs> It was, it was funny, like Jerry Heller, of all people, was involved in my deal for a minute. It was crazy as fuck. Like, Jerry Heller was like, get my hands in this deal. What was, what was his involvement in it? Um, you know, shit, just one of those, like, those finder fees and that, you know, that type of, you know, I, I'd rather not talk about the man, you know. <laughs> but it was one of those fucking crazy deals. Like, if you can get a piece to get your fangs in there, get them in there, you know? Gotcha. And then, yeah. was, was Steve, being that he was so knowledgeable about music and helped you guys so much, I know that he's, you know, sitting in the park, he's listed as co-producer, and he worked um, more than just managing you. He really helped on the music side of things, too. So Definitely. How, how, and why do you think he was able to make that transition from swap me uh, orchestrator to actually helping actually make records? Steve, bro, was very knowledgeable about every piece of music. One of the guys like like yourself, like you know all the history of hip hop, and we was talking about the Kwame's and the different shit. Like he was like you to me, like so he would like take it above and beyond to see hey, why is this like that? Or why is this publishing like that? Or why is this like that? And Steve was like, probably he told me maybe two semesters away from getting like this, like uh, more than a master's, like some master's degree, like in like psychology. Like he was a very smart ass dude. Like he just wouldn't sit back and be like, oh, I think this is that. He would dig in, find the answers, give you the answers and say, hey, let's try it like this or let's do this or he just inquisitive. He asked questions. He had good relationship with people that he can call like a Violet Brown or something that, that just kept him in a loop and just very knowledgeable about music, bro. That he was, he was just awesome about that. He, he would dig in and just get you to, I mean, just set it out there for you and be like, Hey, Croft, you want to, you know, this is a deal they offering you. You can take this amount of your publishing. You can sell it. You can keep this amount. They offering you a hundred thousand for this. You want this to take that. Like he was just that type of dude. And me being young, I listened to a lot of what he said, you know, it was the right thing to do. Okay. Yeah. And then on uh, Funky Rap Singer, another one, another great one. <laughs> so that was uh, you and Quick, correct? On the more uh, Funky, yeah, it was more like, yeah, it was me and Quick. Yeah, you could say that. Yep. So, so what was the difference you noticed versus with a Tony A song versus a you and Quick song for Scandalous. Like I said, when, when Quick touched something, bro, it had like that funk, that swing on it. If you listen to the drums in the funky rap singer, it had just like that 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 swing, that boom, boom, mm, 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 mm. you know what I'm saying? It's just just the quick shit that we normally used to. It just when you used to to me, I'm probably I'm I'm taking it a bit far, but like if Scotty Pippen played with Jordan 
Scottie Pippen looking at Jordan like he used to seeing this motherfucker hit these shots and do these crazy. That's kind of how it was with Quick. I'm like, I'm used to watching him like do these crazy ass beats that knock him out the park. Like the truth hurts or the, all the kind of different shit he did. Tony, 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 all these different beats. I'm used to seeing him do this shit. So to me, it was nothing. Just like he put the shit on and I just jump on it and just, he just made it easy for me. And that's kind of like the funk side of it versus Tony A with our oldies in the format format that he had, he would like, Tony had a, no, a lot of knowledge on the oldies and what to do and what go, like Tony had a lot of knowledge on the break beats and what beats to use to mesh stuff together to make songs, if that, if that makes sense, you know what I mean? Quick just sat down and just took it from what he heard or what he felt at the time and just knocked that shit out the park. Tony know how to like, oh, that goes with this, this goes with that, and that makes sense, you know? and put this under the bottom of that. And this, it worked. It was, to me, a perfect marriage. Like I got the best of both worlds. Okay. And uh, on that one too, I really like the, uh, talking about the girl with one braid and you gotta be careful and like telling that story. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, for you, you know, one of the things that I always loved about Easy e was always something that I also loved about you, that blend of streets, and everything, but then also being very humorous. Yeah. So, um, where does the humor, especially on the writing side, where does that come from for you? Like, what were you drawn to about the humorous side? Well, to me, it was just situations, bro, that I like I would be in, and it's like, like they say, like some of the humor jokes and shit have some truth to it. Like it was, it was that situation for me, like. I'd have been in some, some some strange situations to where it's like, what the fuck? Like, what did I get myself into or pulling up on somebody or going to a neighborhood that I wasn't supposed to just to see this girl? And it was like some crazy shit. Her parents was like off the chain. Like, mind you, like a lot of that shit, like when we was telling stories, I was a teenager in the 80s. So like the 80s for, for everybody was that, that crack generation. So a lot of, I mean, it was just a lot of, crazy stuff going on at the time and to me it was just me reporting what I saw and trying to make some humor but also telling a little bit of the truth about where I was at and what we was doing at the time you know to me the one braid shit was like the girls used to have this hairstyle that went right here and the one braid went all the way back and it was like cute and then it just till it wasn't cute no more it was like oh all these fucking girls got one fucking braid I'm like sick of this one braid shit gotcha <laughs> And speaking yeah. of being a teenager, it always amazes me too that, that you and the LL Cool J's and the Kwame's were so young when you were making these albums. So, yeah. So looking back, are you like, what was it like understanding now or even two or three years into your career? Like, man, when I was 17, 18 years old, I was on a major label. I was doing this. Yeah. Was, like, what was that like? Just looking back at that, bro, it's just one of those things to where it's like, I never understood Soren how much of an influence and how much power that words have and people listening to you or they saying a certain thing or you saying a certain way or, or for instance, like um, my Adidas, you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't understand the power of like your words and saying certain shit can affect our community at the time because it was it was way different from being able to jump on your snap or your Twitter account or your social or IG or whatever and seeing the stories and connecting the dots, you really listen to like your rappers or your, your ball players or whoever to kind of get like that cool swag from them. So when Run DMC said my Adidas, it was like, fuck that. I'm going to give me some Adidas. And then I'm wearing them with no shoestrings in them. It's like, why, why you wear that? It was, we had no answer. Shit, Run DMC do it. We got Adidas like that too, you know? So, it was one of those things where that to me was like amazing to have like people look at what you was doing or listen to your songs and be like, damn, this is um, like, like they know it word for word or verbatim and they'd be like, kind of live by what you saying and shit like that. Like people are really jump in the car with the booming system because the LL said, Girl, uh, cars drive by with the booming system. Like me, I want to go to the swap meet load my shit up with speakers, get amps all over the place and turn that shit up real loud and drive by with the booming system. Right. Okay. You know, so that's kind of like, and to me, you know, it's like 
if I knew at, at that 17, like I said, 16, 17 years old, that I would have that much power, I probably would be a little bit more conscious of what I was saying as far as like the crazy shit now, because I have like little nephews and shit that's like four or five years old. I don't feel comfortable playing like some of my old songs around, you know, fucking like this and doing like that and two at a time and all this shit that we was, we was talking about, you know, like orgy game, like just crazy shit. Like I feel kind of crazy playing them songs around them and, and they'd be like, man, oh, what are you talking? Like, what does this mean? It's like, oh, I don't worry about it. <laughs> you got a few years away from that. Yeah. Yeah. You got, you'll know about it in, in due time. 